Thank you so much. It's great to be with you this morning. Um, praise the Lord that we are able to get together and to do it without fear and, and without any uh, uh, interference and things. That's not true in some of the states that we serve right now. We have a lot of interference from the government in different places and some of our church plants around the Midwest are, are just now starting to perk up and uh, uh, stand up to some of the things that have been happening around there, which is one of the reasons that my wife is not with me this morning. We had been both intended to be here today. Her name is Linda, and uh, she sends her greetings. But uh, throughout all of this whole experience with COVID, his, uh, uh, her mother, who is 82 years old, has been in her own home by herself in Illinois since pretty much the middle of March with people just dropping things off at the porch. I mean, it was almost like she was a leper. You know, let's just drop it at the porch. Let's make sure she's okay. You okay in there, mom? Yep. Okay. Close the door and then move on. So we had this uh, a virtual convention for our fellowship, which was completely canceled because of the, uh, the circumstances that we have at hand, but they did a virtual convention and she always went with us to convention every year. So we had her down this week and then she came up with the idea, but Linda, would, if you would be willing to take me, I really want to go up to Ship Sawana to this weekend. So when mom says, take me to Ship Sawana, you know what Linda does? She takes her to Ship Sawana. So that's where she's at this morning. They're getting ready to wrap up their things and be home later tonight. And uh, so that's why she's not with me. But uh, hopefully very soon, uh, we're going to be able to visit you and uh, drop in and worship together and you get to meet her. Uh, this is, uh, of course, not my first time here. We were able to share a, a, a Bible course in, earlier this year in Prolegomena and had a great time with you all, getting to know you there, and uh, looking forward to the Revelation study. Although, I have to say, I love the transparency that you all have in your church when it comes to your standards about graduating from one class to the next. And, I was in a, and as I was listening to the announcements, reading in the bulletin, that one particular standard for the, for the Sprouts class is very compelling to me. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, you know, I'd like to know, do we want to apply that for the Revelation class as well? Um, I'm talking about the readiness to learn one. I'm not talking about the other one. I'm assuming that one's covered. <laughs> Uh, but that's all right. Take your Bibles. Find chapter 10 of the book of Romans. That's where we're going to head to today. And very much excited about the Revelation class and uh, being able to lead that with you. If you're ready for a good time and in a book... In fact, the only book in all of Scripture that promises that you're blessed if you read it. So that's what we're going to study together. So I hope that you're able to come out and enjoy the class together. For those of you who are in Take It For Credit, uh, be ready for some good work. There's going to be some uh, effort to be put forth and some, uh, and some application of, of your skills to demonstrate your, your competency in the topic. But if you're just looking for a great time and a great study together, uh, one of the most exciting books in all the scripture, of course, it tells us the whole uh, consummation of everything that we find in the Word of God is written in that great book, and we're going to be looking at that together. It's Romans chapter 10 today, though. My title uh, for this message is The Simple Realities About the Gospel of Christ. We're going to cover most of the chapter today, not verse by verse in that fashion, but uh, concept by concept, and we'll expose the passage this way. But I want to draw your attention, start at verse 9, where it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, what, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I've chosen the title of my message, Simple Realities About the Gospel of Christ, because when we examine these verses, in the context of Paul's entire treatise of the book of Romans, 
uh, you, you, you just realize that you're dealing with something that's so simple where this, this grand document called the book of Romans in many ways a magnum opus of the apostle Paul in the New Testament. Uh, it's so rich with discussion and, and, and the, but yet this is where doctrine and spiritual tangibility, they converge in this chapter. Um, you have truth in concept connecting with truth in your life. It's, it's really, really the spiritual rubber of tires meeting asphalt of road. Okay, that's where this is at. It's all right coming together right here. At the beginning of Romans, of course, you have that classic memory verse, chapter 1, verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And for the rest of the entire document of Romans, Paul sets forth an epistolary masterpiece that defines, explains, and applies the saving gospel message. And so when you look at chapters 1 to 3, he unpacks the lost condition of men, Jews and Gentiles alike. He shows their utter sinfulness, their complete lack of righteousness. He places them as hopelessly guilty before a holy God as righteous judge. But then... Paul shows how God himself has established the means of justification, the way to have that judge's declaration of righteousness pronounced over sinners. It's justification by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. And we can all say amen for that, right? Then chapters 4 and 5, Paul talks about the power of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that, that all men, Jews and Gentiles alike, they can by, through him can be reconciled to God. Now you have righteousness imputed. It's not of man himself, but it's that righteousness which is of Jesus Christ given to those who believe. Then he comes to chapters 6 through 8, and he talks about sanctification. He talks about how the power of the gospel, whether Jew or Gentile, again, what well, doesn't matter who it is, they alike, they, the, those who are declared righteous, they've been set apart now. They've been sanctified. They've been made holy, set apart from sin and unto God. And now that they're no longer in bondage to sin, those same people are now to live out the righteousness that has already been granted. But they possess a salvation that according to the end of chapter 8 with some of the most powerful verses in all the scripture, we, are for, we have a salvation that is forever locked and secured to us in the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then chapter 9, he opens this critical discussion within the book. Because if you are reading the first eight chapters as a thoughtful reader might, you would inquire this question, it would come up. How is it that Israel even needs the gospel? How is it that Israel, of all the nations, that they would need this power of God unto salvation? Are they not chosen? Do they not have the law? Were they not the vehicle for the oracles of God himself? How is it that with these things that Israel isn't already righteous? very important question. And he speaks to this in chapters 9 through 11 with some of the most meaty concepts in all the scriptures. But in the midst of that discussion, he gives the verses that I've just read to you. And he explains very simple realities about the gospel. The question about Israel is a deep question, but it really has a simple answer. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to see those words in their context. And doing this, we're going to draw from them the very essence of gospel purpose and mission to which you and I need to be engaged. So we're going to start with chapter 10, verse 1, where we see some of the most transparent words that Paul ever wrote. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is this that they might be saved. I mean, you hear this missionary pulse in Paul. It's very clear. He was so passionate for Israel to come to Christ. When we were to read the opening of chapter 9, Paul even said that Israel's lostness was cause for, quote, great heaviness and continual sorrow in his heart. And it was so compelling that he even wished himself accursed from Christ if his kinsmen, according to the flesh, would be saved. I mean, for you to say that you would give up your eternal place for someone else is, 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 it might be hyperbole, it might be that, that overreaching kind of language, 
but it conveys the depth of Paul's longing heart for his people to be saved. No doubt, over your own lost loved ones, you have felt such things. Where you would say, if, if, if it were possible, I know it's not possible, but were it possible, I would give up my place in order for my lost parents, for my lost children, my spouse, my grandchildren to be saved. I would do that if that would happen. And that's Paul's heart for his people, Israel. But as we're about to see, he also knew what Israel's problem was. He basically says in the next verses, I want Israel to be saved, but they're not approaching righteousness through salvation correctly. Watch what he says, verse 2. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Two points that Paul makes here about Israel not approaching the, the issue of salvation correctly. First of all, he says they're approaching righteousness through works, not by faith. And they're approaching righteousness through the law and not through Christ. And that is a huge problem. That approach is all wrong because it's not the approach that's conveyed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. If indeed chapter 1 verse 16 is correct, it is the power of God, that message which is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believes. It's not of works, but it's by grace through faith that salvation is the gift of God. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy that he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Israel had it wrong then, it still has it all wrong today. Israel seeks righteousness in the keeping, the working out of the law. They elevate the letters themselves and not the person of Christ to which the law points pointed as its fulfillment. And Paul has already established back in that first chapter that the just shall live by, and you fill in the blank, by what? The just shall live by faith. Faith to be made righteous happens by faith. And because of this, three simple realities about the gospel of Christ become plainly evident. So here we are at verses 6 through 8. I want you to take note of simple reality number one. Simple reality about the gospel number one is this. The gospel of Christ is available. The gospel of Christ is available. Verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. Or... Who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. Let's make sense of these words. The gospel of Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation, is not a secret. I've said it's available. It's not a secret. It's not hard to discover. And so to make this point, Paul uses the law itself as he draws from similar words that are found in Deuteronomy chapter 30. He quotes them here in these verses. In that context, in Deuteronomy, Moses was urging Israel before his death to acknowledge that the voice of God that was provided in the commandments and statutes now delivered to the nation, they were not hidden. This was not difficult to find. Verse 6, you don't have to climb into the heavens to retrieve God's truth and bring it back. It's not, it's not where it's at. That's not where you have to go. You, there's the next verse. You don't have to plumb into the depths of the earth and then dig up or disinter God's truth. No, the truth, as it was revealed in Moses' day, according to Deuteronomy 30, verse 14, it's very nigh unto thee. It is in thy mouth and in thy heart. It's that tangible. It's that available right here. 
Paul even says that this truth revealed is of this day. It's the message of verse 6, the righteousness which is of faith. It's just as available. What is it telling us? It, Jesus does not need to be brought out of the heavens in order to be known. The gospel message has already proven to us that has already taken place. Amen? He's already come down from the heavens and he made himself known unto men. Jesus doesn't need to rise up from the depths because the gospel message shows us that that too has already happened. The truth has revealed in the gospel today is that it's available. It is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, in thy heart, that is, the word of faith. That's now delivered through the apostles and preached by God's ministers unto the saving of souls and recorded for us right here in the pages of the Holy Scriptures. And we as the people of faith today, we boldly affirm that the gospel message remains the same. It is as true as ever and it is as available as ever. The mission of God the Son was fulfilled. He pronounced it so from the cross. He said, Tetelestai, it is finished. There is no more death sentence for him to satisfy because his payment has already been made in full. The power over death doesn't need any more display because the resurrected Son of God is still resurrected, praise God. And forever he will remain on his glory, in that glorious state because Hebrews 7 tells us, but this man, because he continueth ever in that resurrected, ascended state, he has an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him because he ever liveth to make intercession for us. He's still alive. He's still resurrected. Hasn't changed one bit. He did that dying so that sinners don't have to. Jesus does the living forever as the first fruits so that we can live forever as the remaining fruits to follow. That's the gospel message. It is no secret and it boasts no unseen entrance. It is true that salvation's gate is a very narrow one, but it does it, it's the only one, Jesus Christ. But it is available because its truth is just as real, just as close to us as the words spoken from the wellspring of believing hearts. You want to know how close it is? It's as close as from here to here. That's how close the gospel is. And that compels me to voice for all of you this moment. If you're here today and you've yet to truly reckon with the issue of your sin condition before God, the righteous judge, you need to realize the gospel is available to you right this moment, right this day, in this place. John 8, 24 teaches that if you do not believe that Jesus is the promised Messiah, if you do not believe that he's the Son of God, quote, you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, Jesus speaking, that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Jesus, our Savior, died on the cross for your sins so that you don't have to die in your sins. You can have that condition changed if you will put your trust, your faith in the Savior himself. Therefore, embrace the substitution of his death as payment for the death that you would have to pay on your own. He stands ready and available to extend that gift of life to you because he has already died for your sins. All that remains to be done is for you to have that condition changed. Don't pay a price for something that's already been paid for. Simply believe the very available gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto your salvation. Do so. Do that today. Simple reality number two. Let's move down to the verses that I read for us earlier, verses 9 to 15. I'll forego reading them once again. But if you didn't catch this, certainly draw your attention to this now. Simple reality, too, about the gospel is this. The gospel of Christ is comprehensible. It is comprehensible. You see, the magnitude of man's sinfulness and the void of God's righteousness it is so vast, it would be easier for you or me to walk to the moon than to overcome the vastness of our, of our depravity, of our sin. It is a completely irresolvable problem. But the solution brought through the gospel of Christ is not a difficult matter. It's not one that's outside our grasp. It is comprehensible. The reality is that it is so comprehensible that with the faith of a mere child, one can find salvation through Christ because with the gospel, both the message and the means is very easy 
to understand, very easy to comprehend. It has comprehensible content. Comprehensible content. We see this in verses 9 to 13. We see here, you see, man, man wants, the, he's got this proclivity. He just wants everything to be complex and then boiled down to its increments. You know, when we think about all the problems we want to solve in this world, you don't just say, put your faith in Christ and then have all your problems go away. No, man's got to make it far more complicated than that. Um, we have 12 steps. Okay, 12. We've got to go through 12. Um, we pass through seven levels. Okay, that's, that's the way we like to. Uh, this guy over here wants us to have a hierarchy of 10 ranks. People in other religions, four stages of nirvana. I mean, it's not just one simple answer. You've got to have all this other stuff to go in there. Uh, frankly, if, every, if everybody else is going to do it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to write a book, and it's going to be about the 98.6 degrees to be normal. That's what I'm going to write about, Okay. Well, forget all that when it comes to the gospel, because when it comes to that, when it comes to what must be believed in order to be saved, the gospel message has comprehensible content. Jesus died according to the scriptures, was buried, and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Did you not catch any of that? That's pretty comprehensible. It's there for us to understand. When a, sim when a soul embraces that simple message about the work of Jesus Christ, as Paul says at the end of verse 9, thou shalt be saved. Now, when it comes to embracing the gospel, what does that include? First of all, it includes cognitive agreement. And I know that's kind of a fancy way of saying it, but Paul says it very clear. If thou shalt, or if a person confesses the Lord Jesus, that word confess literally means from the original to say the same thing. Confessing is going on record with the God who is listening about your agreement that Jesus is the Son of God, that, the, that he is the God that the, the, the Lord has revealed to man. Just as he said to Philip, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. That's your confession. If you will say the same thing to God, that is confession. Cognitive agreement with God. And then the other component to this, to that embracing of the gospel is the core investment of trust. He says, if you will believe in your heart. See, you could have cognitive agreement and you might construe that as simple mental assent. Okay, well, I'll just accept that as a Sunday school fact. And then I'll parrot it just like I could if I were being catechized to say so. That's cognitive assent perhaps or agreement, but core investment of trust goes one more step deeper. There's, that's, that's more than intellectual approbation. Core investment of belief, faith, trust in the simple reality of the Lord's resurrection that was the event that completes the good news story and all that it accomplished for sinners. You see, there's no right, no authority for one to give a gift of life. He hasn't secured the victory over death. Jesus did that by the resurrection. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Is swallowed up in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you embrace that reality with your trust. So if you take that pairing together, cognitive agreement and the core investment of trust, you embracing the gospel is my knowledgeable agreement about the truth that runs tandem with my personal investment of trust that that truth, which is expressed so simplistically in verse 10, that message, verse 12, is for all men to embrace. There is no difference between the Jew and Greek for the same Lord is over all and he's rich unto all that call upon him. And with the soul's call upon the name of the Lord, Lord, that sinner is saved. Verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's nothing more to grasp because there's nothing more needed in order to be saved. The gospel is clear and comprehensible. Comprehensible content. Furthermore, I want you to take note in verses 14 and 15 that there's a comprehensible conveyance of this message. There's a way in which it gets delivered. So if people are to be reached unto salvation, how then does that happen? How is it that men will call upon the name of the Lord to be saved? Well, Paul in these two verses explains a comprehensible process by which the gospel makes its impact upon sinners' lives. 
how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So calling is the first stage of, in this conveyance. That's the soul's appeal from a heart of faith. If we have a heart of faith, we desire to be saved, we call upon the Lord, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So there's calling. There's faith, believing. That's the heart response investment to the message that's been heard. Well, what about the hearing? The hearing is the reciprocal component to the proclamation, which is the transmitting component. So if I'm hearing something, I'm hearing that message, that's, upon, that's the message upon which I believe. And if I believe, I call out to God for my faith trust to be acknowledged by him. And the proclamation is, a cert, is certified by an authority. How shall they preach except they be sent? The authority that commissions the messenger to speak on behalf of that authority. Now that is a simple, comprehensible, logical sequence. Sequence. Watch this. The God of heaven who is waiting to hear the calls of sinners for salvation, he's provided for every part of the conveyance. God himself has the heart to answer every call. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to rep repentance. He accepts the simple faith invested in the message that he authored. He enables the voices to speak that message in the person of a preacher, a proclaimer, an ambassador whom he has sent to represent him. And in this way, through that simple sequencing, the ministry of the gospel can go forth to the whole world. This is why we never have to argue a case for missions. This is why we don't have to make a, an apologetic for evangelism. Because the heartbeat of God for himself is so willing, so ready to save sinners that he made the message and this process simple to comprehend. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is good news. And he commissioned those of us who have embraced that message to share it with the next person who has not yet embraced that message. That is a simple reality. The only thing needed is for us to engage it. That's it. It's that simple. Now there's one more point in this passage and we'll wrap up with this lesson. As we come to verses 16 to 21, we see some very poignant words. And so think along with me, if you would. I've said that these matters are very simple. So if we stopped here, we would, we would, it would beg us to ask a question. And if you're not asking it, I'll ask it for you. <laughs> okay. Why isn't everyone just getting saved if it's that simple? Why is this so difficult? Why, why does the gospel even have to be preached if it's so simple? Why did Paul even have to write in the New Testament all of these things if it's so simple? Well, the answer to those questions becomes the third simple reality about the gospel of Christ. And this one is the game changer. Simple reality three is this. The gospel of Christ must be obeyed. The gospel of Christ must be obeyed. Verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Speaking of Israel in this case, but really it applies to anyone who has not done so. They have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, saith, Lord, who hath believed our report, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And then we're going to follow some of his logic as we un unpack this a little. It's unfortunate that the word obedience in connection with the gospel message is something that's not often emphasized, and yet it is the heart of the issue for Israel rejecting the very Messiah that she was and is supposed to be seeking. Consider verse 16 again. They have not all obeyed the gospel because Isaiah says, Lord, who hath believed our report? Wait a minute, I thought, I thought we believed the gospel. Uh, I didn't know we obeyed it. I thought we believed it. Obeying it sounds an awful lot like works to me. And let me, just, let me clear this up right away. I can understand that possible reaction. Our commitment as preachers, I'm sure this is true of Pastor Hayes as well, and I trust it's true of all of you. We have a commitment to a very clear message of faith, don't we? We said that right, with faith alone, Christ alone, right? Belief in Jesus Christ in order for the gift of life, grace alone, to be secured as a commitment. It's one that we must never lose. We should hold it tenaciously. We should hold it without compromise. Faith alone in regard to salvation. But if we would just parse this out a little bit, I'm certain it will be clear to you. What is the object 
of saving faith. What is that faith to be invested in? You'll, you'll agree with this, I know. It is the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's the object of our faith. We don't put our faith in a message. We don't take the formatted components of letters, words, and grammar, because those things in themselves are not salvific. They are merely the tools for communicating the person of the Savior. Therefore, I am to do what the message says. The message says, trust in the person to whom the message points me. That message tells me that I must put my faith in Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's very important that when Paul and Silas gave those words to the Philippian jailer, they were spoken in the imperative. That's the mood for commands. What did they command the jailer to do in order to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what do you do with commands? You what? You obey them. You obey them. If I obey what the gospel tells me, I will believe. I will come to Jesus Christ by faith. Do you see my parsing and why I'm making it an issue there? Because the simple reality about the gospel, the third one, is that the gospel must be obeyed. And that's where Israel has gotten it all wrong. They have not, verse 16, they have not all obeyed the gospel because in the main, they have not believed in Jesus as the Christ, the son of the living God. They created this breakdown in the process that Paul just outlined. Those verses 14 and 15, calling to faith, to hearing, the preacher, to the commission. Where's the breakdown in Israel? It said point two, they broke it down on the faith part. They weren't looking for salvation by faith. They were doing it through the works of the law, seeking their own righteousness. Well, then, does that mean uh, that what was to happen before didn't take place? Did they not hear the right message? Maybe they got mixed up. Well, that's where Paul starts to argue, verse 15 or verse 18. I say, have they not heard? Could they not put faith in him because they didn't get the message, because they didn't get the hearing? Well, he says, yes, verily they did hear. Their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. It wasn't about the fact that it wasn't spoken and that they didn't hear. So they had the breakdown in that they didn't believe what they heard. Not only did they know the word, but they were also even told the consequence of their own rejection. If you don't believe the word, here's what's going to happen. And Moses, a man clearly sent by God to speak the truth, he spoke of this in verse 19. For I say, did not Israel know? Well, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. And then Isaiah gets cited in the next verse, another prophet fully commissioned by God. I mean, coals from heaven heaven's altar were literally touched to his lips and he told them what would take place verse 20 i was found of them that sought me not i was made manifest unto them that asked not after me but to israel he saith i all day long i have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people the whole process for god to save israel it was working up until the faith part and that's where they messed it up israel hasn't called out to god because israel doesn't believe and this is what he's explaining in context remind ourselves here that paul is discussing why israel's not saved it's because they've ignored these simple realities about the gospel it also explains why he's so passionate to see them put their faith in jesus christ because it's the whole process of god's plan for man to be saved it breaks down at the faith part of the sequence if we don't obey that was the case for israel the gospel of christ must be obeyed and they on the whole have not done so and i would ask of you as we close what about yourself are you aware of these simple realities and have you acted on these simple realities it's just one thing to know the reality the gospel is available we need to know that it's comprehensible and those things are all true and we can all say amen it is so but with that third reality that's the game changer the gospel of christ must be obeyed have you obeyed the gospel by putting your faith in jesus christ the son of the living god i was 
preaching in a missions conference in Southern California. We have a wonderful church that was planted in a retirement community, one of the very first Del Webb Sun City communities that was ever built, built on the desert out near Menifee, California. And a Bible church was planted there uh, back in the 70s, and I was able to preach at a missions conference a few years ago. And I was preaching on the theme that was built out of Acts 26, where Paul was making his, his defense of the gospel and his ministry before King Agrippa. And uh, there's a statement that King Agrippa makes. It's just one of the most compelling statements in all the history of the book of Acts. And he said, sir, thou almost persuadest me to become a Christian. So it was an, it's an interesting unpacking of that. Maybe one day I can come and preach that for you. But that's not an invitation to get another visit. I'm just saying that it's there. <laughs> As I was preaching this message, I had no idea what was going on in the lives of the people that were happening there. I'm there to do an assignment. I'm focused on that task. I know I'm God's messenger appointed for that hour, and that's what I know. But it turns out that weeks, even some few months leading into those meetings, an Iranian Muslim mother was bringing her four-year-old child to the church in the face of great disharmony and difficulty in her own household because of her committed Muslim husband, very antagonistic about what she was doing. Uh, divorce was in the process. It was, just, it was just one of the most messy situations that you can imagine. Conflict and harmony in the home, conflict of, of faith systems. Uh, it, it's just, it was, it's high drama, frankly, what was going on. And, 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 the, and, and the, uh, um, the tool in the middle is this, this is the, the, for leverage is this four-year-old child. It was just as messy as it could. And the pastor's wife had been speaking with her and sharing spiritual truths and seeking to win her to the gospel. But it was in the course of that message that the, the lights finally came on for what she was needing in her life. And so alone in a, in a Sunday school room after the message, again, completely unbeknownst to me, that Iranian woman gave her life to the Lord Jesus Christ at the witness of the pastor's wife. She obeyed the gospel, and she believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know her outcome. I don't know her story afterwards. I wish I did, but I do know this. That day, if her confession was genuine, she was translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Brother or sister, friend, I trust that that's your testimony today. Acknowledge these simple realities about the gospel. It's available. You don't have to hunt for it comprehensible. You don't have to have an IQ to understand it, but it must be obeyed. That's the game changer. Make sure that your game has been changed. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here at Spring Creek. I pray that you will bless us mightily in the times of fellowship that we have together as we gather around your word, as we celebrate what you've done for us, as we rejoice in the truth that you have delivered to us in our final, complete and sufficient form, your holy Bible. Thank you, Lord, for this time. And if there is one soul here, uncertain of their eternal destiny, may they truly believe that Jesus has died for their sins. He died for our sins so that we don't have to die in our sins. Help that person to certify that need and obey the gospel this very day. In Jesus' name we ask these. Amen.